Welcome. Thank you for coming out. And I want to say a uh, to each and every one of you because I'm part of many different organizations. And it's becoming more and more difficult to get people to come out to Jewish events. And that's part of our theme tonight of anti-Semitism. So uh, we're going to be having a number of events here that the Trevor Kaddish is going to be hosting. Bet HaLachem, that we haven't announced it in place yet, but Bet HaLachem for the soldiers of Israel. And they usually have 800 people come out, and we're trying to get more and more people to come out. That's May 28th. We're going to be having Douglas Murray. The Trevor is hosting Douglas Murray, the, the journalist and the famous author, and according to most Israeli dignitaries and politicians, he's the top, one of the top five voices today in defense of Israel. That's a very big event. That's going to be June 18th. If you would like to come, get a ticket right away, because we're, we already sold 600 tickets. We just announced it four days ago. So um, that's going to be a big event. Uh, Shabbat under the stars, June 21st. Friday night, Shabbat this day, you know, what everybody celebrates that weekend. We're going to be celebrating Quebec in Hampstead, and we're expecting uh, 1,500 Jewish people, non Jewish people to come out and celebrate the faith of Israel and Judaism. This year, more than ever, it's important to go out so and, and show you're not afraid and you're not intimidated and uh, you're not going to be held back and you're going to be and you're going to live it as a proud Jew. So um, I really encourage everybody, Friday night, June 21st, join the rest of the Jewish community. We're going to sing the Shabbat songs. We're going to show the world we're not afraid. And that we are a religion of light and love and family and tradition. So uh, all of these things that are coming up in the next month, please stay tuned. The squad is right outside. And I am... Um, uh, Looking forward that we, the Jewish people, understand because the next topic is, I believe, we're going to be talking around the idea of the resurgence of anti-Semitism. This is a, for us. This is a night out for Jews. It's an exciting night, but we're talking about how much we're hated in the world. But I, I want you to know that um, it's nothing new. Don't be afraid. We've been there. We've done it. We've gotten over it. Again and again, and it's actually uh, it's almost like Rashi, the great commentary Rashi wrote 900 years ago. Don't try to understand it. It's it's just it's he wrote this 800 years ago. It's it's part of the almost DNA of, of the world of humanity to hate the Jews. It's, it's going on for thousands of years. Finds different peoples, different cultures, different geographies. As soon as you, you clear it up in one place, it pops up in another place. So just know as Jews that even in the Talmud, wrote 2,000 years ago, Mount Sinai is Har Sinai, the mountain that gave birth to hate. When we receive the Torah, we also receive with it the hate of the Torah, the hate of the Jewish people. So, um, don't get so disturbed, please don't get so disturbed with it. Uh, wear it as a badge of honor. I once heard from my Rebbe that um, it, his biggest fear is that we live in a world where they don't hate Jews, because then Jews won't exist anymore. But if a Jew exists, then the hate will exist with it. It's the catfish of the Jewish people. Catfish of the Jewish people. So, Understand that wherever there's righteousness, wherever there's righteousness, evil is going to try to pursue it and go after it. It's the cost of standing for what is right and what is just. When you stand up for what is right and just, there's going to be enemies that are going to come after you. I guess for sure what I'm trying to say is, you know, a lot of people call me all the time, I can't believe it, I can't, I can't the Holocaust. Wear it as a badge of pride. Know that if they hate you, it means we're still Jewish. It 
means we're still keeping up the tradition. It means that we can still call ourselves the children of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. So I want to thank the dignitaries that are here today. Mayor Hampstead just came in. And uh, all the... Um, talk about somebody who's not afraid of anti-Semitism. So, um, Marvin Rotran, and everybody here, really, I just want to say on behalf of the show, God bless you, thank you for coming out, and not being afraid, and living your life, and coming together as a community, and in that respect, I would like to invite, uh, she's been leading the sisterhood in such a beautiful way in the last year or so, and uh, she's uh, together with the sisterhood, responsible for tonight's evening, so please give a warm welcome to Alina Halper. Sure. 
an hour and an after an hour and fifteen minutes, it might be a little long. So if we have the QA, we try to keep it to about a half an hour and 40, 40 minutes. First of all, I'd like to introduce my wife Catherine Wall, who is company this evening. My mother in law, Marianne Wall, who's a member of this congregation. And I'm sure Rabbi Jacobson remembers her as wife well. She passed away a few years ago, but she was active in this congregation. I've known the rabbi for many years. I remember when he came in the first place. I've already been the counselor. I got elected for the first time in 1982. So his tenure while long here is relatively new for me. And I saw him put his imprimatur on this congregation and welcome a larger community to the, uh, to the synagogue. It's grown, and despite the aging in our community in Montreal, it's a vibrant institution with a long and proud history. Uh, I'd like to personally thank Gloria Jackson. She worked with me, uh, made sure that I was clear about what I needed to do, that I had what I had. And I'm here this evening. And I have some good news to share that has nothing to do with my speech, but I'm sure we'll delight you. About an hour ago, the Montreal Police Department announced an arrest in the shooting incident of Yeshiva Godola on November the 12th. The suspect is a 20 year old. We don't know if it's a him or her. And oddly, in the police release that just came out literally one hour ago, uh, there was no identification of the suspect. I've already called for that person to be publicly identified. We have the right to know who the person is. And we have to know, have the right to know what sort of charges will be laid. Clearly, in my mind, this was a hate incident, and the full force of the law should be imposed. So I was elected in 1982 as a city council. I remember it well. My mother said, you can't possibly win. You're running against a guy on the executive committee. Everybody knows him. I had a problem. His name was Jerry Snyder. And all, the neighbors were largely Jewish. Alter Cocker was like my dad from Europe. They said, Jerry Schneider, and you're the French guy. Hold on. I'm voting for a Jew. We had a tech for a time. So a lot of that first campaign was in Yiddish. We put ads in the Adler to say, vote for the Jewish guy. His name was Roach Rat. I worked in the end. I got elected by a pretty large majority. The rest is history. I served on city council for 2021. And I kind of miss it a little bit. I know a lot of you are recognized faces. Some of you are my constituents. Some of you actually worked on my campaign. Others are friends. Some of you were former constituents. And I remember when you moved out of the neighborhood. Nothing worse than repainting someone's street and they either die the next year or move out of the neighborhood. <laughs> but having said that, uh, I was true to what I believed. And a lot of what I believed was changed in Montreal to that. I have friends in every community. A good friend of mine died recently at the age of 88. His name was Dan Miller. He was leader of the Black Coalition for that. And no one was more pro Zionist than that. And no one believed more in building bridges, not only in the Jewish community, but other communities. It's a real hero. Recently, City Council voted a resolution presented by my successor, Sonny Moroz, who's not here this evening. And I'm sure I can probably understand why. And your counselor, your days aren't 8 for 12 hours often 25 hours long. So you never know what's going to hit you. But Sonny Moreau took the motion asking the city to give a place name for Dan Phillips and have passed council. And a year or two from now, there will probably be something to memorize, to memorialize that Dan, a person who actually fought for greater good and always stood against anti-Semitism. You know what he told me? He said, I'm saying against anti-Semitism. When there's anti-black racism, I expect you to stand with me. I said, absolutely. Now, the city's been pretty good with place names that represent our community. Recently, a new park was built for Eli, what, Eli Weisel in the Snowden area, which I represent. It's not quite finished, hasn't been officially open, but it will any week now. Before that, the city agreed to a $15 million project to build a new park. <laughs> I, I may be good at figuring out how to manipulate the council into voting for the right thing, but I'm terrible with technology. We'll be back with my football. We named the park for Sadie Bronco. It's at the corner of Bucking and Victoria, which is north of Jean Talon. It's a beautiful chalet, a beautiful green space, it's a brand new neighborhood. So there's been a willingness 
to have place names that reflect our community. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. My parents were Holocaust survivors. They came to Canada by boat in 1948. My father first worked in Granby, and then moved to Montreal in the textile trade, in the Schmata business. You know why I speak English? You know the first question they asked my father is, are you Catholic? When he said, no, I became an Anglophone. He didn't speak a word of English. He became an Anglophone when I was born. I automatically went to the English school system. That's true of a large part of our community. But we're diverse as a community here in Montreal. We are increasingly Francophone, Sephardic. We also have a large community of Russian-speaking Jews. In fact, they have their own community center, their own newspaper. They are vibrant, and they, they work with us as, as well. And there is also a community of Jews in other places. There is an Ethiopian Jewish community right here in Montreal. So we are very, very diverse as a community. But we are aging, and we really need renewal. So I went to Sir George Williams University. I got my degree in history. Discovered you couldn't do too much with a degree in history. So I went to McGill University, and I got my teaching diploma. And I was a high school teacher. Until one day. The bus from Snowden was no longer there. It mysteriously disappeared. One of the most popular buses in the city, the number 65 bus, went all the way downtown, served the hospitals, all that. was there on, on Friday, was gone on Monday. Nobody could understand it. And you know what the city said? You don't need the bus. We just opened the metro station to take the metro. But it did not serve the needs of the community. A lot of people were inconvenienced. So I started a petition. And very short time later, we had 10,000 names. Now, Stanley Grunfeld is here. Stanley, you worked on that campaign back in 1982. Do you remember the 65 bus? And how total an issue it was for the public. And I told everyone, it is not a transportation issue. This is a democracy issue and symptomatic of much of Montreal. Jean Drapeau did some great things for Montreal. But in 1982, he was running for the city of Montreal, the metropolis of Canada, already perhaps on the decline from 1976 onward, but the metropolis of Canada is still in 1982, like a small shoe store on St. Warren Street in the 1950s. All right? That had to change. And eventually, our group took over the city in 1986, and we made some durable changes. Now, the Hebra Kedisha was already here. Both Hebra Kedisha and Benet Jacob go back to the 19th century. And this synagogue, I believe, was built in 1933. It was here when I was already a counselor, and I remember the building well. I came here in October of 1982, three weeks before the municipal election of the candidate. I was greeted by the Creative Social Center. Some of you remember Helen Knight? Should she created she created the organization? It's still here in this synagogue doing good, good work. And she told me we're going to privilege art, culture. We're not every Saturdays every year. And I said, Are you sure you got the membership for She said, Absolutely. I said, I'm elected, I will support what you want to do. They invited me back a month later because I now had a title called City Council. And guess what? That began a beautiful relationship that goes right to this day. Well, I was a counselor, got the city of Montreal to partner with the Creative Social Center. We provided logistical support and financing. Uh, we worked with them. We brought people in here for the uh, Beverly Sash every year. And we had uh, some very, very good times over the year. Still rewarding the members here. Before I go farther into my speech, I want to recognize Jeremy Levy. He's the new mayor of Hampstead, the new boy on the block, has been around for almost, almost three years as mayor of Hampstead, but he's active and he doesn't mind speaking his mind. I only had really a couple of files that were with him. He did come to the neighborhood meetings that I hosted and I appreciate that. But recently, he was targeted. And you know why he was targeted? He was targeted by the haters because he did the right thing. What was the right thing? He passed a bylaw in his community to find people who tear down the posters saying free to hostages. A lot of people came to council, mostly wearing goodbyes, and with the connivance of the city administration, 
were steered to Germany. They originally came to the city council and they said, you're in the wrong place. Come, come next week and give them a hard time. I don't remember the exact words they said, but the, the thing that happened is a week later, there were a whole bunch of people to criticize Hampstead for promoting genocide because they find people who tear down posters saying free to hostage. Thank you once again for what you did. So I'm going to ask you, do we have an anti-Semitism problem in Canada? Let's find out. Now, recently, the neighbor of Canada issued its, 19, uh, its 2023 audit of anti-Semitic In 2022, the neighbor noted that there were 2,769 anti-Semitic incidents in Canada. It's a pretty high number. Now, the neighbor began auditing in 1982. And 2022 was the second highest number ever, 2,769, slightly less than 2021. Anyone venture a guess what the 2023 numbers are like? Did they go up 5%, 10%? Did they go down? No, they go up. You know that? Go up. The number for 2023 was 5,791. And that's an increase of 110% over 2022. And half those incidents occurred since October the 7th. Pretty scary. 2024, just from publicly available data, suggests that this year is going to eclipse the horrible year that we saw in 2022. The first quarter, saw all sorts of violent incidents, particularly in Toronto. Some of the stuff we saw in November, December in Montreal, such as shooting at Jewish schools, arson attempts at the St. Catherine Community Center, an effort to bring out a Jewish community council on the carry near Vizina. Incidents like this started happening in Toronto as well. We had all those people decided to demonstrate outside of the Jewish neighborhood, trying to block exits on and off the 401. Why? No particularly important buildings around there, it's just within the heart of the Jewish neighborhood. So we have a lot of incidents. So we're on track, if things continue like this, that 2024 will be even worse than 2023. According to the neighborhood, eight provinces saw an increase in anti-Semitic incidents. Prince Edward Island, once again, had zero incidents. It's the smallest province. And one province had a decrease, they say, of about 30%. And that province is Quebec. And I don't believe those figures. I just believe that the neighborhood does not have the resources to properly track the French language media and to essentially be on the ground like the need. 2022 was a significant increase in Quebec, and Quebec's had a lot of significant incidents last year. So I'm suspect. But supposing that number is right, we still have a problem when you have hundreds and hundreds of incidents in the province. Now what we saw in some provinces is pretty worrisome. In the prairies, which the neighborhood defines as uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan, the number of incidents went up from 67 to 310, 22 400% increase. British Columbia went up from 242 to 482. That's significant. But it's not only the number of incidents in a particular province, it's the type of incident. In 2022, there were 25 violent incidents targeting Jews in Canada, according to the neighbor thought. I wrote it. I verified the data. What we had, I was able to sign off with. I felt that it was a correct figure. In 2023, the neighborhood reports 200, uh, 77 violent incidents against Jews, an increase of 208% in one year. Moreover, harassment went up from 2,056 to 5,282. That's a big figure. That includes 405 incidents of people being harassed in person and the rest being harassed online. Those are extremely scary numbers. But Canada is not an anomaly. 
Recently, Tel Aviv University and the Anti-Defamation League came out with their own report. They worked with Jewish organizations in five different countries, and this is what they came up with. Now, I want to point out, the first number, you might be puzzled, because the number in Canada and the one in the U.S. sound almost alike, and the Jewish community is significantly larger in the U.S. But we have different metrics for tracking. There are some things that, in the United Kingdom, they don't consider anti-Semitic or hateful, which they do in France. In Italy, there are certain things they track, but the United States does not. But what's the important thing is, if you look at the numbers year after year, you compare year after year. So what did Tel Aviv University and the anti defamation League find? In the United States, the number of hateful incidents targeting Jews went up from 3697 in 2022 to 7523 in 2023, an increase of 105%. That's almost the same thing as the tracking for Canada when it was 110%. In France, where you still have a fairly significant Jewish community, the number was going up from 456 to 1,676 incidents, almost four times as many. In the United Kingdom, it went up from 1,662 to 4,103, more than double. Germany, from 2,639 to 3,614. Italy, from 241 to 463. Now what we're seeing in all these countries is not only more incidents, but more violent and more harassment. We're seeing a lot of attacks since October 7th. And it's driven by people who are calling for the destruction of the state of Israel, who are promoting willful anti-Semitism different jurisdictions across the Western world to promote an agenda of the destruction of Israel. And everywhere, we're saying the same sense of confusion of authority who don't know what to do. After all, we in the West, we believe in free speech for Democrats. They've never seen anything like these numbers, and they're not certain what to do. And police departments don't know what to do. do we, which laws do we apply? We are not seeing many arrests in these type of incidents. And it, it leads to all sorts of things which government agencies tell us, give us a solution. Now, I'm going to get to that in a moment. Now, I read Statistics Canada documentation on a regular basis. They put out a report every year on police reported hate crimes. Those aren't the same things that they Britt tracks or the ADL tracks in the United States. These are actual complaints that directly went mm. to police departments. Now, not everybody complains, so the numbers may appear to be low, but again, what's important is the year to year. There has been a huge increase in hate crimes in Canada from 2012 to 2022. Statistics Canada's numbers are not out yet by the way, the neighborhood has its number publicly available on its website. And they show that the numbers doubled between 2012 and 2022. It went up about 10% a year, so after 10 years, it's 100% more. It's doubled. 2023 is so shocking, no one knows what to say. How can we witness anything like this in Canada? And it is a national scandal and the only topic of debate in Parliament. Because it should be. We have never seen anything like this, and they've never seen anything like this in the United States, the United Kingdom, or France. We need to have solutions, and I'll come to that in a moment. But Statistics Canada monitors hate, aid, and racial minorities, the black community by far the number one. Target. It's a larger community than the Jewish community. The second largest targeted community in Canada, year in, year out, is the Jewish community. Now, when you look only at religious minorities, Jews are by far more targeted than all the other groups put together. In 2022, the number of hate crimes reported to police against religious minorities decreased in Canada, except for one group, 
Jews. In fact, Jews by themselves were 66.9% of the targets of hate crimes in Canada aimed at a religious minority. So when you put Muslims, Catholics, Hindus, Sikhs, and everybody else together, they represent 33% of all police reported hate crimes, according to Statistics Canada. I have no reason to believe that it won't be equally shocking when these numbers are public in 2023. That should be sometime in the month of July. So what can we do about it, ladies and gentlemen? Now, before the hate affects more of us, we need to work with those who can help us. And I'm working with United Against Hate Canada, so I'm sure you It is a group that promotes cross-cultural dialogue. Our board is made up of people, the black community, the Asian community, Muslim community, the guy Pakistani on, on, on the board. We have former politicians on the board. The board represents a broad profile of what modern day Canada looks like. And guess what? The board of our group believes the number one problem regarding hate and tolerance in Canada right now is anti-Semitism and nothing else. And as such, we have decided to work towards solutions. What we propose is a second national summit to combat anti-Semitism. And we call on communities to support us in promoting that. The first national summit was held in July 2021. It was called by Irwin Cotler, the Honorable Irwin Cotler, former Justice Minister, who was in 2021 Canada's first special envoy for preserving Holocaust remembrance and combating anti-Semitism. And he called that national summit because there was an upsurge in hate based on the war with Hamas in May of 2021. That war pales in comparison to what we are experiencing now, but the government of Canada said, okay, we need a summit. And there was one that was held in July of 2021. Well, I felt that exercise was important. Why? There are four or five things that came out of that which I think were useful to the Jewish community. One, the special envoy received funding. The post had been largely ceremonial before that. The government put in $5 million to fund the Office of Special Envoy for preserving Holocaust, remembering, and combating anti-Semitism. And that was a big game. Second of all, there was a reform of the security infrastructure program. More money came and the parameters were loosened so that more institutions, with, including synagogues and Jewish community centers can access the money that was available. And more recently, the rules were loosened again to pay for things like security guards at Jewish schools and synagogues. Before it had to be hard infrastructure like cameras or security doors or whatever. Now it's more flexible. So I consider that a game. Next, the government of Canada is a member of the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. It's an international organization that has 36 full members and nine associated members. Canada joined in 2009, and in 2019 it adopted the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism. The summit pointed out that too few civil servants and police officers had ever heard of the definition, couldn't recognize anti-Semitism if you looked them in the face. So there was an agreement to train those in the federal government to do a better job on this. The government also promised to issue a handbook to make the IRA definition known to the public and known to the civil service. And they're working on that right now. Recently, Deborah Lyons, who is the second special envoy for preserving Holocaust remembrance and combating anti-Semitism was in Montreal to consult the community. I was one of the 10 or 15 people she asked to give their opinions on how we could better promote IRA. The handbook should be out in a couple of months at the most. And that would be used in government. Finally, it got the government of Canada off its derriere, if I 
can say it that way. Canada sent a delegation to the International Conference in Malmo, Sweden, held on anti-Semitism and to look at what IRA had done as an organization to fight anti-Semitism. And our delegation was actually headed by the Prime Minister. I believe only two or three of the 50 countries as a part actually sent their, head, their Prime Minister or their head of state. And we had some good promises from the government of Canada. All of this is important. But now we need a second summit. The United Against Hate Canada has invited municipalities to support us. I'm very pleased to say places like the city of Cold St. Luke, Richmond Hill in Ontario, a community of about 200,000 people, Ajax, Ontario, uh, Prince George, British Columbia, a whole bunch of places in Western Canada, the English Montreal School Board have all passed resolution asking the government of Canada to quickly, quickly convene a second national summit. We're looking for other municipalities, perhaps Hampstead could join us with the motion to urge the government to, in essence, convene law enforcement, civil servants, educators, municipal, provincial, and federal elected officials. We need to work together, and the summit can do a great deal rather rapidly moving forward. We issued a public letter, an open letter, on April 15th. I'm very pleased that some media, particularly the National Post, made a huge story. In that letter, 200 prominent Canadians joined me to ask the government, hey, do you know there's rampant anti-Semitism in Canada? You know we need to get together and find a pragmatic and quick solution to do so. I'll give you just a couple of the names of the people who signed. You may not know all of them, but they're all well known and they're real news. Sherry Wilson is a minister in the government in New Brunswick, and while cabinet ministers usually are neutral, that is, even when they agree with you, they won't put their name on it. She signed. Chris Palmer, an MLA in Nova Scotia, who has spoken often at Jewish organizations in the province of Nova Scotia and so on. Sherry Gambin Walsh, the Deputy Speaker of Newfoundland and Labrador. Ryan Saunderson, former member of Collingwood, Ontario, now a member of the provincial parliament, and completely the parliamentary secretary of the previous board, maybe MPP for Simple Grades. Greg Ottenbright, the MLA from North and Saskatchewan. Ken Boshaw, the mayor of Thunder Bay. Shelley Carroll, the counselor for, for Toronto. Lenny Zhu, from, counselor from Vancouver. Uh, Sonny Morose, counselor right here in Montreal. Joe Ortona, the chair of the Montreal um, English Montreal School Board. Matt Lula, Councillor for Ottawa. Jeffrey Lee, Mayor of Hampstead. Mitch Brownstein, Mayor of Code St. Luke. Tim Thomas, Mayor of Point Claire. Other communities also added their names. I'm very proud that Bashir Hussein, who's a Muslim, President of the Council of South Asian Communities, signed his name. Brian Chang, Vice President of the Chinese Association, signed on behalf of his community. Kumar Dev, the president of the Bangladesh Hindu Association, signed. Maria Yakdaikan, the president of the Filipino Canadian Community House, signed. Reverend Rudy Fidel, the Faith Temple in Winterville. Cynthia Wade, the Barbados House. It's a broad based movement, yet we're getting very little traction. We have not won this demand. Every member of parliament has a copy. The Liberals are waiting for someone to ask. The Conservatives are waiting for the Liberals to move. The NDP doesn't want to know. We need more public pressure to get to the second summit. What are we looking at for the second summit? We want to see the principal civil servants at the table. We want to see police departments from across Canada at the table. We want to see educators, particularly from the university milieu. We are experiencing a wave of anti-Semitism on our campus. Jewish students tell us they're intimidated. And yet we're not seeing action. We need to have those educators at the table to tell us why they're not acting, what their problems are, what their impediments are, and what we can all do to help break this long term. We need community leaders. We need elected officials. And when I say elected officials, I think it's important not just to have the guys in parliament, but to also have the municipal guys and the provincial guys. Why? 
Education is not a federal mandate in Canada like it is in the U.S. It's provincial. It's the provinces that control that. And in most provinces, they actually break it up. Universities and secondary and elementary are different. There's a minister for secondary and elementary, and another generally for university. Public security is generally municipal. The Montreal police, while the laws that create their organization are not the one that assembly, they report to the moderation council. They're local. Same thing in Toronto. The Toronto police are. They are not run directly by Ontario, they're run by the city of Toronto. In Ontario, you do have the Ontario Provincial Police, but in Quebec, we have the city of Quebec. Those are provincial, and they would fall under the provincial ministers of public security in both cases. They too need to be at the table with us. Federally, we have the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the RCMP, a federal body. They work under contract in eight of the ten provinces. They are municipal police in a couple of cities. Their commissioner needs to be with us at the table. We feel that the situation is so grave that we don't understand the hesitation of why the summit has yet to be called. We think the summit needs only three months of prior presentation. Thus, if the decision is made in the coming weeks, we would be looking at September or October for the summit. And it needs to happen. But it's not the only summit. In introducing me, uh, Gloria mentioned that I had worked to promote Holocaust education. And that's an important model. A person I admire is Stephen Lecce. He's the Education Minister of Ontario. In November 2022, he called a press conference to say that as of the next school year, Holocaust education will be mandatory in elementary school in Ontario, grade six, and it will be mandatory as well as in grade 10. He pointed out that 35% of students who were surveyed in Ontario said the Holocaust was fake, or it was exaggerated, or that they weren't sure if it happened or not. It's a shocking thing. And it's similar the surveys in the United States have been showing the same thing for a long time. And these students say they get their information online and they said never happened on no, that's fake. And a lot of them believe it. Stephen Lecce said that's fueling anti-Semitism. We've got to fight it. He became the first minister to say we're going to do this. Now I ran with that and I went to all the provinces and I asked, will you do the same thing? And most of the education ministers in Canada did improve things. Because it was possible, up to the time Mr. Lecce went public, to graduate from school in Canada, in any province, and never have had one minute of instruction on the Holocaust. Well, now, British Columbia says they're going to teach the Holocaust in grade 10 as of the 2025-2026 school year. So a ways away. Alberta, same thing. They're going to start teaching it in grade 10. 2025, 2026, bought it, they can do it a little faster, they'll introduce it at the end of the 2024, 2025 school. Saskatchewan, same thing, high school. Manitoba, finally we had something good happen. Manitoba didn't know they were doing anything good, and the candidate who became premier, Bob Canoes, was the provincial MPP. Made a public pledge to the main grid, a lot of the main grid, and he was elected to significantly improve Holocaust education in Manitoba. And he had, he actually got back to me and said, you know, we're already teaching it in elementary school. I didn't even know that, but we think this week we're going to improve it and we're going to make it mandatory in high school. New Brunswick, excellent. The government of New Brunswick has funded a mobile Holocaust exhibit that's been created by Atlantic Canada Holocaust Foundation, goes around the province. Every kid gets to see everything in the province. And it has an impact. And they've improved their curriculum. Prince Edward Island, they agreed their curriculum is weak. They hope to have something in place by 2026 
2027, it was a long time. Newfoundland, we're still working with it. Nova Scotia, great, but some improvement. The one place where we have not seen significant improvements is Quebec. Now, the uh, Genocide Foundation did work with the government, and they did produce some materials that are excellent that are used. That's not compulsory. Some teachers teach it, others don't. Some use the materials, others don't. Uh, we've had no ability to change them. I've written to Mr. Van Bill. You know, I know he got a person who's giving me a hard time over the council. He used to play on his radio program. When he was PP minister, I used to fight with him all the time. He came out at city council. I guess he didn't like it. But he told me he liked me personally. He just didn't agree with 100% of what I believe. But I figured it's nothing like Holocaust education. How could you disagree with that? But we're weak in Quebec, and it has an impact. Uh, and there have been cases where there have been anti Semitic incidents in schools where kids have made fun of the Holocaust because they said it's Jewish. Not true. So we have our work to do. Other things we need to do is we need to convince municipalities to have dedicated units aimed at hate crimes, you know, hate crimes units. Montreal has one, Toronto has one. Some large cities have them, others do not. And most police forces in Canada have very small resources for their area of crime. After October 7th, Toronto did double or triple the number of officers allocated to its hate crime unit. It went up by a factor of 10. In Montreal, all they would say is, we feel we have adequate resources, can you please tell us how many more uh, officers you have? I put a lot of pressure on Montreal after um, October 7th, particularly after the shootings in two schools and the fire bombings, the efforts to create arson at the synagogue in the Hall of and the Jewish Community Center. Uh, where were the arrests? This should have been the number one priority. Uh, that's why I said the good news about the arrest today. But that's still only one arrest for many, many incidents. But we don't have the necessary resources. I'm convinced we can do far, far more. The next thing we need to do is we need to uh, train our officers better to recognize anti Semitism. Just having more officers doesn't guarantee anything. They don't have the background. And that's why the IRA definition has to be part of the training so that they understand what anti Semitism is. And why Jews feel attacked, and how they can uh, how they can uh, uh, react to that. We also need to have the attorney generals in all ten provinces and three uh, territories publish their guidelines for when they apply uh, Article Three Eighteen and Three Nineteen of the Criminal Code. In other words, an actual hate crime. I went to a case recently where. Uh, a man was sentenced to 16 months for uh, hateful remarks and anti Semitism. It was rare because in Quebec there are almost no cases where they use these two articles on hate in criminal code. Because otherwise, it's just an assault. It's not a, it may be a hate motivated assault, but there's nothing in the law that gives you extra prison time because it's hate motivated. It has to be under these articles. Willful promotion of now, it's a high bar to clear it legally, and a lot of prosecutors don't like using it. So let us know the guidelines, because that allows us to use community to ask the necessary questions. Online harms. Much of the hate today has migrated online. The government's finally getting around to emulating what a lot of communities in Europe have done, a lot of countries in Europe, and online harms to kill the 63 at the table, the parliament, and some of the discussion. But they probably won't be unanimously adopted. Conservatives are arguing violates free speech. To me, I'd rather be safe than occasionally say that perhaps we crossed the line about free speech when somebody said it's a Jew's fault, all right? Whatever it is, we are a democratic country, we have rights, so we don't have the right to promote hate and target people. And that's what we've got to do. And we've also got to make sure that the kids aren't being targeted at a young age when hate is promoted. That law is going to go to Parliament Commission where people a lot smarter than me are going to dissect it and come up with the solutions that we need. We also need to get every province 
of every territory would not be either uh, definition of anti-Semitism. Ontario was the first to do so, and it did so before I got involved in the Red for the Jewish community issue when I was a city councillor. The uh, uh, government of Ontario did that in 2016, I think they were the first ones to do it in Canada after the federal government, not before the federal government. And they're serious about it. The ministers in Ontario, including uh, Minister Ford, who is the nephew of Premier Ford, they told me personally, we will make sure it's distributed in Ontario civil service, and we understand what it actually says. Alberta has been really good as well. There was an order in council, Premier Smith adopted, but there was also a resolution adopted by the legislature. Saskatchewan, Premier Moe said, we stand uh, with the other definition. They adopted that in December of 2022. Manitoba not adopted IRA also twice, once by order in council by Premier, then Premier Stephenson with the Conservatives, and another time by a motion moved by the Liberal opposition, the third party. Uh, um, the Liberals in Manitoba were always in close to the Jewish community, and when there was no movement on IRA, they moved the motion and Manitoba got by the next day the Premier adopted an order in council, the day before the vote on the motion, she told the Liberal and the uh, to John, Dr. John Gerard, she had brought his motion to Manitoba that was doing it. We insisted it's the only legislature. So now we have two resolutions for Manitoba. New Brunswick has done this, Newfoundland has done this. Jerry Byrne, who's the parliamentary secretary uh, as an MP, he made it a priority. So we got two places in Canada, provinces that have done this, and they are British Columbia and right here in Quebec. Now here in Quebec, the minister in charge of minorities and anti-racism, Benoit Chabot, refused to move the motion, but he got up during member statements to say he supported it, his government supported it. Some Jewish organizations said that's enough, I don't. I want to see it adopted either by a legislative motion or by an order of council. And they haven't moved. But I'm giving a lot of room to Premier Lego. I don't agree with him on all the constitutional stuff. I'm quoting from 96, Bill 40, Bill 41. But we have opened, agreed to open a Quebec bureau in Israel. He has spoken about how it gets hate on campuses. And he's been very, very clear in his stance with the Jewish community. He's trying to help to So nothing bad to say about them this evening. I'll take questions in just a few minutes. Uh, I'm almost, almost finished. I cut it down to my shortest shadow. <laughs> we also need a couple of other things. A national action plan to combat national summit. We don't have one. And that could come out of the second national summit. We need to find a way to hold universities accountable to practice national summit, which is out of the field. And we need to do more dialogue with other religious and racial groups. Let's make friends with them. My friend, Norberto Mangetti, is here from Canadian Pinot Radio Montreal, who's broadcasting his job. A lot of people have been watching him for in this room. <laughs> you know what Norberto was doing on May 14? He was down in the Plastic of Canada holding the flag of Israel. Many Filipinos came with him. He had a bus full. And then others said, we were 75, 80 people in the of the Philippines, Canada, and Israel, and chanting for Israel. The Philippines is a historic friend of Israel. You may not know this. It is one of the few countries in the world to open its door to the Jewish refugees to flee the home country. The President Azon said, I will save as many as I can. The Philippines wasn't fully independent. It was Commonwealth, the United States State Department, who also the roadblocks up. We got as many as we could before the Japanese invaded and took over the most fascinating story of the Jews of the world. The Philippines voted for the rebirth of the state of Israel in 1947. It was the only Asian country to do that. It has warm relations with the state of Israel, it's growing trade, 
There's growth in tourism, technological exchanges, Israel life also exceeds for agriculture. There are 100,000 Filipinos who live in Israel. You may not know this, but former ambassador to the Philippines in Canada, Petro Nuno Garcia, his son's married here today, his kids are joint citizens of Israel, Philippines, and the United States, and she leads fluent Hebrew. When she moved to California, did you get a chance to meet her today? On June the 2nd, we are hosting a Zoom call to expect hundreds of people, we've got a number of MPs and senators, community leaders, and others speaking, ambassadors as well, bringing the confirmation from Ambassador Moed, uh, Ambassador Austria from the Philippines Embassy will be speaking, and we'll be talking about this historic friendship and how important it is. I'm going to provide Mrs. Schachter a copy of the Zoom link. I'm hoping that she'll be treated. You're all welcome Sunday night, June 2nd at 7 p.m. We will have a global audience. Our group's also working with the Black community. There's a historic Jewish community in the Caribbean. We're looking at the research to promote those stories. We're looking to tell the Jewish community about emancipation. They've asked for our help, we've asked for their help. So there are solutions out there in action that we can do. And we ask each and every one of you to put your action, make sure that you make friends with other communities, and you tell them about our people and our group, and we support them because they will be surprised. Surprised how many of us are together. I'll conclude with this. There was a recent poll done by Harvard and Harris. I know Harvard these days is a bad book, but they put a, a poll out. Who do you stand with, Israel or Hamas? The poll showed that the numbers supported Israel by going northward in the United States to record the drama. The more encampments on universities compared to the better it is for Israel. The public isn't buying it. They don't like the hate. It's gone from 70% standing with Israel to 82%. I would not be surprised if the numbers in Canada are saying, your neighbors stand with you. You are not alone. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. Yeah, so there are any statistics to let us know the age of the groups or the people even call the group of the individuals that are creating these hate crimes. An average age, or a baby. There's somebody, I don't know, just came back from my body already. Could you speak a little louder? Okay, the question is, do we have any idea of the ages of the people that are creating these hate crimes? Are there groups in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s? I am convinced that malign foreign actors are behind a lot of this. Um, in Canada in particular, and the United States, a lot of Canada's stuff is being manipulated behind the scenes by who called Samoan. Samoan is a wing of the popular front for liberation Palestine. It's a Marxist Leninist group. They're not the only ones. The Islamic Republic of Iran has its engine fomented in different places as well. They obviously have an impact. Where Israel is strongest is on people above the age of 60. Where it's weakest is people under the age of 30. University students, obviously there's a lot of confusion on campus, and a lot of people don't understand what they're demonstrating for. I'm for peace. They're empowering a death cult that wants war, but they don't see it that way, and they're being told under our side of the game. So the profile of most of these guys, younger and unfamiliar to the state of Israel. The second person there, sir. First of all, thank you for your delivery. For I'd like to know what is the community background of those who committed these hate crimes. I'd like to know which communities are breeding those individuals. That's one question. Excellent question. I won't be able to give you a clear answer 
Let me give you a story about it. First of all, I was puzzled today when the Montreal police said they made an arrest. They told us the individual was 20 years old and lived in the borough of LaSalle, but gave us no further information. When a person is arrested, their name is generally public. It did raise questions in my mind, but I don't want to make an assumption. However, um, at the, where there have been arrests in the United States and university, the background tends to lead partially versus Middle Eastern origin, but not entirely. It runs through the mill of regular American students of all sorts. In Canada, we haven't had that many arrests. There was a case at the Indigo store in Toronto where 11 were arrested, where oddly enough, charges against four were dropped yesterday for reasons that are clear to me. Among the other seven, they represent a broad spectrum of, of Canadians. Um, those arrested tend to be younger, but not entirely. Some of the people who have been arrested are in the Philippines. Harvey, when a hate crime is reported, and it's found, why is it not possible to identify at that time who makes a crime or what is his ethnic or communal background? Why is that so difficult to get? Why? Because in Canada we have strict privacy laws. They won't tell you who's accused until they make an actual arrest because of any false accusation. When a person's arrested, they won't tell you their ethnic background. They'll give you the person's name and age. But however, you have the right to go to court. Uh, you, and the information on people who are arrested is public. Nothing stops you from publicizing widely, widely who has been arrested. And by the way, I want to say this, because I think, back in your mind, you're probably thinking that all the people who are arrested are Muslim. Some of the people that are arrested in the US and Canada are Muslim. On the other hand, we've had a lot of support from different elements of the Muslim community. Some Muslim leaders have been extremely courageous. There was a rally in Toronto, uh, 400 people showed up, uh, all from different Muslim communities, and they said, we stand with the Jewish community. Here in Montreal, the, lead, the leader of these, the Council of South Asian Community said, we're not for Hamas, and we're not violent, we don't support this, we stand with the Jewish people as well. A lot of those guys are courageous because they had a lot of pushback from people who obviously feel to be the different way. But however, having answered your question, I'm going to go to somebody else. Only to say, in Canada, we do not identify someone. When someone says they did it, we only identify them when they're arrested right. and they're free. I know that in Germany, they passed a law that requires every new German citizen, prior to his education before he goes to the test, is to learn about the Holocaust. Absolutely. And I don't know if the same feature exists in Canada. Okay. And if it does not, perhaps it's another another way to introduce new Canadians to the uh, notion of the Holocaust, to the uh, catastrophe of the Holocaust. Germany has far better Holocaust education. We can learn from them. And, the and we can learn from them. And they have been far earlier and they supported Israel than most countries. We have a lot to learn from them. However, we need all of us to push for better Holocaust education. Let's start right here in Quebec. We're among the worst in North America, the weakest. 28 states in the United States have improved their Holocaust education curriculum in the last couple of years. Most of them have something. It's almost impossible in the US to get no Holocaust education. And despite that, a third of students still think it may never happen or exaggerate. Whereas in Canada, we're beginning to see a couple of ministers speaking up. I cannot downplay, I cannot say how important what Stephen Lecce did in Ontario was. It's a, a challenge to every other minister in Canada. Why can they do this in a systematic way in Ontario by teaching the Holocaust in grade six? So kids know it was real, understand how horrible it was, and understand the suffering of Jewish people, and you can't do this in other provinces. We have a lot of ways to go. Uh, the third person, Aaron. Sure. So um, in Canada, we also we have hate law. In, the United, in Canada, we have hate law. In the United States, you have the First Amendment. 
How much of the figures where you said basically in one year it doubled the statistics, how much of that is skewed in the United States because of maybe unreported the fact that they were uh, not subject because of the first amendment in West Canada looking at one of these things against our history? I hear you. I think, however, we need to step back because in Canada it's not that easy to actually charge anyone. Criminal code only has two articles. There's no such thing as a hate crime in our laws. There's a crime called willful promotion of hate. Two articles, 318 and 319. Rarely used. There's a guy from the White National Party in Saskatchewan who was convicted in the a year. There's a guy who promoted hate, saying Hitler would be happy, all this, uh, who was convicted here in about 16 months. But in most cases, they'll bargain it down, even when it's apparent to you, you're targeting them for a Jew, because they say it doesn't meet the criteria of the law. Uh, that's why the neighborhood tracks something that's very different than Statistics Canada. Statistics Canada is tracking about a seventh of what they originally, but it's stuff that falls within the context of those two articles of the law. So, Clearly, we have a problem. Not everything is considered hate, even though it's hateful. Uh, Mr. Duncan. I think a lot of us here are the same demographic. We remember the Nazi Everyone should realize in Canada it's not the police that charge someone. It's the police that prepare the ghost day for the charging. It's the crown that decides to either charge or not charge the individual. My own feeling is Iman Charkawi has always been problematic. To me, it appeared clear that his remarks were anti-Semitic and aimed at fomenting violence against Jews. He know, knew quite well that 95% of the Jewish community considers himself to be Zionist, that is, to support the state of Israel and see it as the Jewish homeland where Jews have always lived since time immemorial. So he knew that was a threat. By the way, it's a little interesting sidebar of the Charcali incident. The anti racism commissioner of the city of Montreal was at that event and said it's not going to Her name is Bashra Nana. She was appointed by She was appointed by Valerie Plant, the mayor, the mayor who does not call out anti Semitism. The mayor who brought the motion of my old friends and I presented to have Montreal adopt the hybrid definition. The mayor who welcomes people who go and bother Charlie Levy at Echo Council. The mayor who had not set a single living by Israel ever. Bashra was there. Prime Minister Trudeau the next day said the remarks by Imam Sharkawi were anti Semitic and hateful. Premier Begot the next day said the remarks were hateful and anti Semitic. But Bashra Manaki, who was there, who's the city's anti racism commissioner, said nothing. And when it was outraging the community. She started with Elias Macro, the broadcaster on CJD, found her Facebook and tweets and screenshots of her some really hateful stuff. Definitely, you know, uh, infantile, destroy Israel type of stuff. And now he wants to cover her. She's still there. You may recall there was an, a full page of Andy the Suburban signed by 40 Mon Montrealers in March, and I was one of them calling for the dismissal. And yet the city covered for it. So that's another 
aspect of that particular case. But you know, the answer to your question is uh, we need to know how the various attorney generals of the province decide that they go ahead uh, with hate crime charges or not. Uh, what means, which boxes need to be ticked before they decide? Because they decide so rarely that the community is outraged when something happens here. And in my mind, shall Kelly cross the line of willfully fomented violence? All right? The fact that nobody afterwards was killed, they couldn't trace that betrayal to him, in my estimation, doesn't get them across the line. Do so. You're far too modest. Excellent speech, by the way. You should be out here, all right? Yes, you're doing good work, right? It sounds like you made progress. You're going to learn, and what you do, you know, MR, and all these things are important. I'm overextended. I will help you. I'll take your number. I'll call you when you chat over here. Right? However, you know, I mean, just like stuff today, I mean, I'm working on the desecration of the Senate path in the trial we have today for the trial. But I, Conversation with 10 different black organizations about the emancipation. I'm talking with folks from the embassy about getting them to help our event on June the 2nd. We're looking at stuff with other communities as, as well. I'm trying to get certain provinces to do stuff, and I don't really have a lot of resources. And by the way, don't even think of the name Franklin the Jewish organization. It's small compared to the Federation of Seizure. The need is greater than our resources, all right? But I, Appreciate the fact that there have been other downloads on my I will try to do so. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I, I appreciate that. And I, I just I was playing the laundry by coming on you on the game because you're throwing me easy and I understand how busy you are. And I just want to tell you that the fact that our community was the next main grid Canadian grid in the middle. We made a lot of decisions in our community first, and we've gotten a lot of support. And I think it's because of activists like you that we hold everyone to do the right thing. So thank you. You know, we, I used to tell you what I'm saying. I have been to people. There's so much work to the council. If I get it all done, it takes me eight days a week. Then I got a bit older. I told people I slowed down. I was no longer working eight days a week. I was a session. Now, now that I'm on the council, I'm fine, but I can't slow down. I've got the same rhythm. I'm always involved in the process. Unfortunately, we've all been taught a lot of people come to you and say, can you help me get a photo of the same side? So but I'll do what I can. One more question. Not that.
Rabbi Jacobs, who said, I just began to tell you the reason. And who said, I'm going to do something that's different. It's the most, the oldest form of hate is hate. It's been around for millennia. And it's more metastasized, it's modern anti-Semitism now, anti-Zionism. And that is one of the reasons why we really push the idea of education in the 80s and push more of the Jewish Holocaust. And that is why we support the Iowa definition. It's legitimate to criticize Israel, if you criticize Israel, the way you criticize any other country. Or to say, oh, well, that's right, you can say, stop the land, whatever. It's anti Semitism. That's what we're going to people to understand. And I believe most of the public does understand that. I'm going to conclude by giving a shout out to my friend, Alan Simon. Norman is president of Canadians for Coexistence, an organization that brings people together. The website has five, 6,000 people on it, and it's always standing for Israel every single day. Please look it up and join the community. If you like to join the community, please subscribe to the community website. I encourage you to support the good work. They always publish my stuff. I appreciate that. But however, someone calls out your video, they want to make it better. Thank you, and we'll see you. Mr. Wilkrat, thank you for sharing your knowledge, insight, and reflection with this most appreciative audience. Your words were powerful, impactful, and will undoubtedly resonate with us for many, for a long time to come. I do believe that we have to thank you for so much more than this evening's address. For decades, you have been the voice for all of us representing all the people with your tireless effort to render our municipality, our city, stronger, more inclusive, reminding us that diversity is something to be embraced. In this moment, as a daughter of Holocaust survivors, of all your accomplishments, I must give my heartfelt thanks for your diligent efforts to improve Holocaust education in our schools, for Holocaust remembrance to continue, as well as your tireless efforts to combat overwhelming global anti-Semitism. In an increasingly troubled world, your voice of reason, honesty, compassion. Mr. Rotran, thank you so much for this inspirational evening. It is indeed a privilege on behalf of the Sisterhood of the Pebra to present you with this honorarium. May you go, continue to go from strength to strength. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you for sure donated my last honorarium from last week's speech to the Sisterhood. <laughs> this is my father's coffee club. I want to say I know James from way back. She was a member of the issue of my last one. I'm not from the door, 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 I'm not from the door